Welcome. I'm David Shulman, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub, and it's my great pleasure to open this very timely Atlantic Council front page event featuring U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo in conversation with former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and Environment Keith Kruk. Today's conversation is hosted by the Global Tech Security Commission, a joint effort between the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub and the Kruk Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue designed to rally like-minded countries and leverage the innovation of the private sector to develop trusted technologies and compete effectively with China. This effort could not come at a more important time, as China's rapid high-tech development has become a key facet in the unfolding strategic competition between the United States and China, particularly in many of the critical and emerging technologies that the White House's National Science and Technology Council has identified as significant to U.S. national security. In recognition of this, President Joe Biden recently signed into law the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, which, among other things, provides the Department of Commerce with $50 billion to revitalize the U.S. position in semiconductor research, development, and manufacturing, while also investing in the modernization of America's workforce. We are fortunate to have Secretary Raimondo here today to discuss the CHIPS Act, its implementation, and how this legislation fits in the context of the Biden administration's broader efforts to promote and protect U.S. tech innovation and impact millions of Americans. Secretary Raimondo, it's an honor to host you today. And it's fitting that the Secretary will address these issues today with Global Tech Security Commission co-chair Keith Kroc, who, when in government, led the charge to enhance U.S. economic security and forge a global network to advance trusted technology. To our audience, thank you for joining us from all over the world for this important discussion. I encourage all of you watching to join the conversation on social media and share any questions you might have using the hashtag ACFrontPage. With that, I'll now turn things over to Keith Kroc to kick off the conversation. Keith, over to you. Madam Secretary, thanks so much for spending the time to talk about global yeah. tech security and the important role that the Chips and Science Act plays mm. in that. Do I have your permission to call you uh, Gina? Please. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. I would yeah. love it if you call me Gina. Yes. Well, um, Gina, first of all, I want to thank you for your visit and with Secretary Blinken out at Purdue. You know, uh, you're now an honorary Boilermaker. I love that. Although, I don't know if you know this, but my husband is a Wolverine. <laughs> and so when I went out there and I said, I think I'm an honorary Boilermaker, he did not like that. So the, the create a little family tension. Well, I remember when you when you talked about Michigan and, and, yeah. and Mitch Daniels goes, well, we don't look at those guys' competition. Exactly. That was so funny. <laughs> he is so competitive. But in all seriousness, what we saw at Purdue that day was unbelievable. Like really cutting edge, exactly where we need to be. So all credit to you and... I mean, President Daniels is such a leader. It's, it's he fantastic. Is. He is. He's done a great job. You know, the Wall Street Journal calls him the most uh, innovative uh, university president in America. And mm. now, you know, uh, Dr. Mung's going to take his mm -hmm. place, who, yes. who uh, worked in our team at the State Department. So we're really excited about that. And yeah. I think it's, it's really turned out to be a great national security mm -hmm. university. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where we need to be. That's right? Like, creating n more engineers, right. teaching engineering differently in a way that's more accessible. But also, I love, you know, they created this whole semiconductor master's degree program. Right. And the day that we were there, so people know, there right. were dozens of chip companies m on campus recruiting. Yes. They had a job fair. Yes. I mean, that is just what it's all about. Yeah, and, and Purdue, uh, you know, really has specialized over the years in manufacturing yes and, yes yes and the innovation side so you've got the combination of as you, in your words lab to fab but yeah but then also all the way through economies of scale business development mm -hmm. right and building companies so. I mean, the truth is we will need more of that yes because in implementing the chips act yes we think we will stimulate the production of 
I don't know, 10, 11, 12, 15 more fabs in America. Right. 100,000 plus manufacturing right. jobs. Right. High end, you know, high end, right. high skill tech manufacturing. Right. So we need more research, talent yes. in all areas of that manufacturing. If you can't just build the fab, people have to work in the fab, people have to innovate in the fab. Totally. Yeah, the human capital side of it is, is yeah. just, it's everything. Well, I, wa I want to thank you for making the implementation of the Chips and Science Act a uh, strategic imperative for the United States. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, uh, this is such a powerful uh, uh, thing. And, and, you know, when I talk to my fellow Silicon Valley CEOs, mm. they compare it to uh, the Apollo program. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. it was a great bipartisan mm -hmm. win. Mm -hmm. And when we were originally architected it with Senator Schumer and Senator Young, we knew that General Secretary Xi of China was absolutely obsessed with the semiconductor mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. And another the thing that's great uh, is that it's that bipartisan win because we also know his biggest fear is the United United States. Exactly. That's exactly and right. So I guess one of my questions for you. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a bunch of CEOs out there, university presidents. Uh, it's really important, I think, out of the gate in terms of implementation strategy. Uh, to have showcase universities, showcase mm -hmm. customers that can kind of set the standard. Maybe share with the audience, you know, in your mind, what would be that ideal implementation partner? Mm. Oh, that's a great question. So, by the way, I will say, it's nice to talk about implementation. Often, yeah. you know, members of the press say, well, you got chips passed, what are you going to do now? Right. I'm like, no, 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 the job begins now. It just begins. Just begins now. Yes. This is an unbelievable opportunity to implement this. Yes. And I have really a, a big, bold vision for it. Apollo is a good example, yes. which is to say, you know, so we are going to be soon issuing, um, you know, a, a real call to the American people to step up, mm -hmm. which is to say universities. Yes. We're going to have to produce orders of magnitude more engineers, more technicians, right. more computer scientists. And so we're going to be going to universities and saying, work with us. We're going to put out, you know, this is how many engineers we ought to be producing right. a year. This is, and then asking them to step up, work with us, work hand in glove with industry. Yep. That's the magic right there, that industry, to go ahead and produce the talent that is required. Right. Same thing with research. Right. You know, we want to stimulate massive amounts of core research and development into new materials. Yes. Packaging. Packaging is going to be a key area of development forward. These chips can only get so much smaller. Right. You know as well as I do. So we want to ask research institutions to match up their research with our national defense needs. Right. Um, so when we th when I think about an ideal partner, I think of <coughs> someone who wants to be collaborative. Yes. Who wants to work with government and industry. Right. And who's really going to focus on this. Right. I mean, this is a, you got to meet the mission here. Right. You have been on this for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, God bless you for being one of the people early on in the wilderness, you know, <laughs> waving the flag, pushing us here. Now we have to meet the moment. Yep. And that's why we, this is a very truly an all hands on deck for everyone everyone in America, even K through 12 education. Yep, absolutely. Tr tr truly, I mean that. You know, if we do our job, this and history is written, we will be the, at the beginning of a new chapter of innovation and growth in American manufacturing, yes. American research and development, and strengthening our, our our national security and defense. And so it's like, I'm really quite excited to, to be leading that effort. By the way, what a great honor. <coughs> and you're right. I mean, we would look at this as an inflection point mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not just the CHIPS Act. It's the 6G Act. It's the Quantum Act. Totally. It's the Bio, Biotech Act. You know, we've got $200 billion of that going to research institutions, which is uh, just absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, it's also, that adds a little more pressure to our work. Yeah. Because everyone, everything you just said is true. We need, we need a yes. similar effort for all of that. You yeah. know, synthetic biology, all right. these other areas. People will look to the implementation of chips. Yes. Did you get it right? 
Did you meet the mission? Was it impactful? Right. And if the answer is yes, I think we will be able to convince Congress and others to do more. Right. Because that was, you know, that really, really is going to lay the foundation exactly. for everything. Exactly. Right. You know, one of the um, uh, w one of the things that uh, supporters and non-supporters of the bill, probably the biggest criticism was mm. um, safeguards against mm -hmm. China's intellectual mm -hmm. property theft. And, and, and we both know that uh, uh, the Chinese government has a powerful lobby here yeah, in but Washington. Yes, yes, yes. They lobbied against the bill. They, they were lobbying they, against this bill. That's how you know it's a good That's one. That's how you know it's a good one. Right. I would say that to Congress. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. You know how you know this is good? Right. China's lobbying against it. Yeah. It, it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those safeguards are, are really, really important. You know, uh, Strider Corporation just released uh, a report a few weeks ago. Uh, and the bottom line is this. It documents that I think it was 153 uh, scientists from the Los Alamos National Laboratory got recruited back to China mm -hmm. for their domestic wow. uh, R&D and military R&D. Mm -hmm. And many of those were part of their famous uh, flagship 1000 Talents yes, yes, yes. program. So <clears throat> share with me maybe some of the uh, things Commerce Department, uh, the government, and also how can uh, corporations and universities help in terms of protecting that intellectual property? and the product and process technology, because this is an all hands on deck effort. Yeah, it, this is so hard. You have to be, we all have to be so vigilant. Yeah. Vigilance is the word I use. So we worked with Congress to make sure that in the, in the law, there are some guardrails. You know, none of these companies can, if you take this money, yeah. you can't be building leading edge fabs in China. Right. Like the minute you take this money, you, we don't right. want you building the most sophisticated uh, chips in China. Right. If you take this money, if you do any expansion of your legacy chips in China, it has to be to serve the Chinese market. And that's a big one. People would be shocked to know how much of the testing of the chips that go into U.S. military equipment happens in China. Yeah. You know, it's it's every you know, Keith. I know. You know, at every piece of the supply chain. It's so in true. any event, yes, it's true. Even though we're the legacy yeah. chips, if you make the mm. legacy chip in China, let it stay in China. Right. We don't want those chips coming into our right. you know military equipment, airplanes, cars, etc. Uh, there are other safeguards that we have in place around IP protection, mm -hmm. uh, and and I'll tell you this. We're going to be very hard-nosed in the Department of Commerce in how we implement this law. Yep. For example, the law gives us pretty wide latitude, discretion into who we can give the money to. Yep. So we're going to look, does this company have a good record of complying with IP protections? You know, are they doing everything they possibly Absolutely. can to protect America's mm. IP? Same thing with export controls. Yep. If, if a company has a long history of trying to violate or get around mm -hmm. our export controls, they're not going to get the money. Right. So we plan to be um, practical yep. but responsible. The whole point of this yep. is to secure our national security. Right. And um, we're pretty w eyes wide open about China's threat. You know, that is so, uh, it's so great to hear because uh, one of the original things, the way we looked at it is this, uh, the CHIP Act, the money that is like a, you can use it as a carrot and a stick mm -hmm, to exactly. end this rampant IP theft, for example, in, in universities. And that's such a, I mean, such a big deal. And I've, I've experienced it myself. Uh, the company that I built 25 years ago, we invented B2B e commerce, mm -hmm. Reba. Mm -hmm. uh, we experienced intellectual property theft from Alibaba. And really? Yep. And I, I shouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And, and uh, I went over a couple years later and I talked with the Chinese. I go, when are you guys going to stop stealing mm -hmm. our intellectual mm -hmm. property? Mm -hmm. And they just kind of looked at me and smiled and said, you know, we don't really have a word for stealing in, uh, <laughs> in Chinese. Like, if it's there, you take it. And it's your guys' fault for not protecting For letting it. us have Wow. And that, you know, uh, that, was a, that was an awakening. That's eye-opening. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and this is where we need the help of corporations and universities. And yes. one of the requests we're getting at the Institute for Tech Diplomacy at Purdue 
is to put together a set of best practices mm -hmm. for these policies, process, mm -hmm. and procedures um, to guard against this intellectual property theft. So uh, we'll be putting that together. And, and this is another reason why I think it's so important to have a showcase university because they set the standard. Yes, we'll work with you on that. Okay, great. Because the Commerce Department, that would within be the Commerce Department, yeah. we have NIST, which sets all the tech yes. standards. Cyber standards, of course, we run the patent office. Yes. So we, it would be great because a lot of companies, yeah. particularly the smaller, mid size, yep. they don't know what to do. Or they could really use uh, a work plan or a template. Yes. And so setting the best practices uh, would be really a great thing, a By benefit. The way, to that, them. that would be great. And, you know, one of the folks who's on our advisory council at the Institute is Arden Bement, who was former director of NIST <coughs> yes, uh, yes, under yes. Uh, President Bush and President Clinton. So that's great. Yeah. Um, that's really good. Uh, you know, one of the other things uh, is w we're involved with this Global Tech Security uh, Commission. And we have one commissioner uh, represent, uh, one each for our top 15 technological allies, and also one for um, each of the 14, we collapse it into 14 national security tech sectors. And their mission is to develop um, a global, over the next two years, a global tech security strategy for the mm -hmm. free world. And so my question to you is, how could this be helpful to your efforts in terms of the Chips and Science Act and the things that, that, that you're doing? Yeah, you know, I think that obviously we're focused on chips. We, we, I, have a, I have a job to do. We yeah. have to make sure we have leading edge chips produced in America. Yeah. We don't now increase our talent supply, increase R&D, and increase our legacy chips in the U.S. But beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, you can't have any innovation without chips. Right. And so I think that to have a strategy around yep. other technologies, yep. AI, pharma, biotech, quantum, you know, machine learning, all these other areas, to have that roadmap matched up with what we're doing in chips yep, would be super important because yeah. the most cutting edge um, technology in terms of chips yep. has to be in America. Right. It's not now. It's in Taiwan now. Not here. Right. But to know, for example, okay, this is this is a strategy of where AI is going, what we're going to need from chips, yeah. will really inform the way we invest. The other thing is, don't forget, people forget, and I want to point this out, of the $50 billion, $11 billion is for research and development. Right. National Semiconductor Technology Center. Of all of this, that's the piece I'm most excited about. Yeah. Because that's next generation. Right. You know, that's not building fabs today in the U.S. That's what's the roadmap for future innovation. Right. And that work would fit in perfectly with what you're talking about with these technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of like where are we going with right. the rest of this technology right. and how does that inform the chip R&D roadmap. Right, exactly. And by the way, the great thing about it, it drives a lot of great paying jobs. Too, yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yes. And I know you're super focused on Obsessed, that. Obsessed, yes. And um, so if you look at the, the chips model, that's be the precursor for advanced communication model, quantum Correct. model, uh, Correct. biotech uh, model. You know, um, most of these commissions are focused, uh, really I think when I, when I look at them, it's like pointing out the problems and then having some policy recommendations. We're really focused on offensive and defensive mm -hmm. strategies and also building a global trust network mm -hmm. for the adoption of tech trust standards to accelerate mm -hmm. uh, that adoption of, of uh, trusted technology. Um, so let me ask you this. In terms of you know the offensive, the defensive, building that network, what would be some of the things you'd like to see in that uh, global tech security strategy? You know, somebody should come up with a concept for clean networks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, that was brilliant. Sim yeah. Brilliant because it was simple. Uh, it was simple. And also brought allies together. Right. And that, I think, is the absolute key yes. to success. The yes. key to success in all of this. Yes. You talk about trusted networks, yes. um, technology standards, trusted standards, right. it has to be done in coalitions with our allies. Right, absolutely. That cannot be said enough. Yeah. And if you look at, like, say, the Global South, 
and what China's doing in Africa. Yes. It's, it's insidious, Keith, because yes. when, you, when you change the standards to, say, uh, preference a Huawei or, or make it harder for right. a European or U.S. technology provider, that like bakes into the system right. a lack of trust. So I think you know one of the things I co-lead is this U.S.-EU Trade and Technology Council. Yes. Getting with the EU, a yep. trusted, long-time trusted partner, shares our values, right. to set the standards. Right. What is a clean ICTS network? Right. What is responsible use of artificial intelligence? Yep. Right? Uh, and on and on and on. Cyber, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. And, and so we have to do that with the EU, also in the Indo-Pacific. Right. I spend a huge amount of time now right. with the Indo-Pacific countries in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines. Right. We want them to adopt standards so that um, we can have trust. Right. You know, data flows, that's a whole other topic. You that know, is trusted data flows. Yes. Uh, so there's so much here and none of it is, it's all like in the weeds. Right. And it's but important, matters. To, you know, it's important to lift it up. That's how we kind of looked at it. Wh you know, when we finally got the authorities to make this last ditch effort to defeat China's master plan to control 5G. They had just announced 91 yes. 5G deals, both sides of the hour hitting the panic button. And we just l looked at it, it boiled it down to trust. Yep. And you know, my first 60 bilateral meetings with my fo foreign counterparts, economic ministers, finance ministers, and whatnot, when I came into government, I would ask these guys, you know, uh, how's your relationship with China? Mm. And they would go, oh, they're a very important trading partner. Mm. And then look both ways and go, mm. oh, we don't trust them. Mm -hmm. And that rang bells in my head mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. a year before that, I, I was standing in front of all our DocuSign employees and going, mm. we're not in the software business. We're mm. in the trust business. trust business. We deal with people's most important documents. So true. Those are the ones you sign and trust is most yeah. important work. And I think given um, where we're going with data, you know, you just the ability of companies to collect data, yes. analyze data, or artificial intelligence yeah. and such, which could be used not for good, right? right? Data used not for good. Um, you know, you, th you think about the fact that, like, American soldiers have video games on their phone. Oh, I know. Supplied by non-U.S. vendors. That means China knows where every one of them is. If yep. If they have a GPS location. So, what I'm all saying those is, ten cent games, all those right? ten cent games, right there on their phone. Where yep. is that American soldier? So, as we move it, further into right. what technology uh, is capable of doing, yes. trust becomes so much more important. It, by the way, it's the it, it's the most important point because, you know, technology sh has to be used to advance freedom and combating techno authoritarian. And this, I mean, yeah. You know, we're f facing a four-dimensional game of yeah. diplomatic, economic, military, and cultural chess yes. from our rivals. But the crossroads and the main battleground is technology. Without question. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is just, it's so, so critical. You know, in, uh, in the clean network, in rallying these allies, it was amazing um, that when you put something in front of people and you talk about trust and also get the CEOs, Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. the key thing. Always the key. That was the thing of the State yeah. Department. They go, well, we've never had guys calling uh, global CEOs, you know, before mm -hmm. I go, well, tell you that mm -hmm. you're important, right? And treat them like a customer, right? Mm -hmm. Customers mm -hmm. are always right. You need mm -hmm. a value proposition. Um, so, you know, one of the other things I'm hearing from um, uh, corporate boards and CEOs is mm. I'm seeing that corporate boards are now demanding from their CEO a China contingency plan because mm. they're mm. seeing mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. you know cracking down mm -hmm. on the private sector the extreme mm. covid thing um and uh and and and, and we're, we're actually getting requests at at the institute for you know hey what would be a checklist of risk mm. and strategies we could take um what do you you know yeah. what, what would you think would be important to to put into that because uh, these guys were blindsided by Russia and 300 yeah. companies had to yeah. just pull out like and 
this is would be 10 to 20 times bigger. Oh, yeah. It's interesting you say that, you're hearing that on boards that you're on or from board members, because I hear it too mm -hmm. from U.S. CEOs. Mm -hmm. Even in especially companies that have been manufacturing in China for decades. Right. You know, you hear a lot from manufacturers right. in China who've been there 10, 20, 30 years, and it'll be just very disruptive for them right. to leave, but they're looking at it. They're putting plans in place. Yes. And they and it's hard to argue with them, by the way. Like the climate's getting tougher, uncertainty, she's increased towards um, autocracy. It's yes. I it's hard to argue. So we what I say to them is, um, you want to go to places that are working with the United States right. to align Right. Their standard, their tech right. standards, rule of law, transparency, right. anti-corruption. One, and in this thing, one of the things I'm leading with Catherine Tai is this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the IPEF. Yes. We've we've gotten this coalition of 13 countries in the Indo-Pacific, right. and I'm telling you, Keith, the biggest benefit to the countries that sign up for our standards in the IPEF will be what you're talking about, U.S. companies. Exactly going from China to fill in the blank, right. Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. Because right. if you sign up to the pillars, right. the U.S., it's signing up to privacy standards, right. rule of law, transparency right. in supply chains, tax and anti-corruption, labor, environment. Right. So it's a, like a stamp of approval yes. from the U.S. government. Yeah. So if you're a CEO saying, okay, for various reasons, I want to reduce in China and move someplace else, right. Well, you know, if, for example, Malaysia has already signed on to the supply chain pillar of the IPEF, yep. that's a better place to go. With we're doing some of that work for them, right. that checklist yep. that you talk about. And see, that is a great value proposition that you're offering these countries. I think so, Be yes. And, cause we and offering U.S. companies. It really oh, is a win-win. Yes. You know, U.S. companies need it. It's good for U.S. workers. Yes. And these countries, you know, like I was recently with my counterpart in India, yeah. just to take one example, yeah. the whole focus is to lift people out of poverty. Absolutely. You know, um, one of the other initiatives, uh, now that you brought that up, one of the other initiatives we started at the Institute is called the Trusted Tech Finance Initiative. Mm. This is a partnership mm. with mm. Opportunity International, the mm -hmm. biggest issuer of microloans in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, these loans go to people who are living on less than $2 a day. And so we've hooked up mm. with a lot of Silicon Valley companies to provide solutions in low-income countries to close the digital divide, particularly in the rural areas. And Opportunity International, they give about, I think they give 2.3 billion loans, and they have a 99% pay back. Wow. Ask me why. 98% of the incredible. loans go to women. Ha! And they, what go. they have is they have trust groups and yes. trust banks. Yes. So every, and, and I used to be on the, the Board of Governors way back when, and I would take my, my older kids when they were teenagers, and we would hand out loans, and you would see. I love that. It, it, it is the most scalable concept. This would be something, you know, I had a chance to, mm. uh, you know, I chaired the, the, the DFC um, back when I was undersecretary, and this is exactly what I was looking for. We yeah. called it, at the State Department, we called it, the titanium package so we could go mm. to our ambassadors, our commercial officers, our econ officers and say, here's a prepackaged solution. So anyway. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I think I will look into that. I appreciate you yeah. bringing that up because yeah. we do have to, ha we have to make it easy. Yes. We have to make it easy. Prepackaged solutions matter. Money yes. matters. Financing matters. Yes. You know, it's not enough to want to do the right thing. Right. We have to enable it. Yes. Yes. Well. Listen, I think our time's coming to a close, but, I, okay. I, but I, first of all, I want to thank you for everything you've done from a national security perspective, for the average American worker, mm -hmm. for innovation, for, and for global tech security. My last question to you is, so things go according to plan. Tell me what it's going to look like 10 years from now. Oh, the country's producing you know, a million more engineers a year. We have created 150,000 new manufacturing jobs, hundreds of more startups related to chips. Um, our dependence on Taiwan for chips is, you know, cut substantially. Mm -hmm. 
just it's just like a new dawn mm -hmm. of innovation. Yep. You know, 10 years, right now, if we had a whiteboard here yep. and we drew the curve of R&D investments uh, as a percent of GDP, you know, it's just a straight oh, yeah. line down. So right. 10 years from now, it's like the beginning of the Boom. comeback. And the same for U.S. manufacturing. Yes. You know, the beginning of the comeback. Yes. And, you know, the thing I think that's so great about this, and this is one of the things we s showed Senator Young and Senator, is you get a threefold, you know, hit by matches from all the corporations. So this is like a catalyst. It's a Easily. Spark. Oh, I tell that to people all the time. Yeah. You know, people say, oh, Secretary, $50 billion is so much money. It's not nearly enough. Right. My job is to take that $50 billion and turn it into a couple hundred billion. Right. From all sorts of private capital. Absolutely. And you, you're seeing it now. I mean, I think it's... You've already started. Unlock. I, this has to right. be an unlock. 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 This has to unlock and crowd in right. other sources of capital. Right. That's great. Well, Gina, thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you for you. your service to the country and everything thank you do. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Thank you.